Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is awesome. The, um, uh, as I said, the Privacy Insights series brings you this timely webinar where we want to talk about the important, you know, the important stuff that's happening today. And what's happening today is literally what's been happening for the past decade. And that gives you an idea of what's what the future holds from the perspective of privacy compliance, privacy enforcement, and the way organizations are adopting uh, privacy policies internally. So um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go around the table and introduce our speakers. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, to say that this presentation is made under the auspices of the <coughs> Knowledge Flow Cyber Safety Foundation. It's a uh, it's a nonprofit foundation that mostly deals with with uh, with protecting um, vulnerable sectors like children and and seniors and so on from from different types of cyber threats. So. Um, Insofar as this is the hosting organization, I'll be moderating this panel today. And we've got three awesome speakers, panelists uh, that you can see here on the panel. So I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll ask our four guests and Amalia, who uh, is my uh, associate at MPC at Managed Privacy Canada to introduce themselves. And we'll go, we'll go backwards from the image that you see on screen. So Derek, I wonder if you could give us a one minute intro, just pretend that you're stuck with us in the elevator for one minute and, and let us know who you are and, and what awesome stuff you're doing within the field of privacy. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Derek Lackey and I'm uh, two roles. I'm the managing director of Newport Thompson and we help uh, organizations implement privacy management programs. Uh, but I'm also the chairman of the Response Marketing Association, and I um, I entered the privacy world from marketing. So my entire background is marketing. I owned my own ad agency in the 90s, and I've lived my entire life in the marketing community. So I come at privacy from a marketing point of view, and I'm I'm really more interested in what do I need to do as a marketer than I am uh, arguing the legal nuances. Um, and I realize that somebody has to argue the legal nuances, but that's not me. So I'm far more interested in the implementation of new practices in an organization that makes you compliant. Excellent. Thank you, Derek. And, and for those who don't know Derek, he's also got very deep domain experience within CASEL and lots of interest within uh, Canada's anti-spam law. Um, Constantine. So, hi everyone. Um, I am um, been in privacy for a number of years now in a number of different roles. I am counsel at Innovation, uh, which is a boutique privacy law firm based in Ottawa and Toronto. Um, prior to that, I have been uh, in consulting at a couple of different organizations. I have been a chief privacy officer in two multinationals. Um, and I've been doing privacy for about 19 years, um, dealing with multinational privacy issues as well as Canadian. Um, and so my um, engagement or involvement with clients is uh, helping them to build privacy programs. I worry about the legal nuances um, and also dealing with all of the other stuff, which could be, you know, dealing with incidents, helping to support, you know, doing privacy impact assessments. but a big part of what I'm doing lately, and it'll color the comments I make later, is around supporting uh, contract with uh, you know, clients um, now having to deal with privacy obligations expressed by a contract. Excellent. And, and I think the, the key word there is nuances. So Constantine certainly has the depth that, uh, that we seek on this panel. And, and in the interest of full disclosure, Constantine and Amalia have been my colleagues as we've uh, we've lectured on privacy uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, but um, a great friend of ours is Vance. Vance, would you mind giving us uh, an elevator intro? 
speech? Sure. So I'm Vance Lockton. Um, I'm currently a senior technology and policy analyst for the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. Um, I'm not representing them today. I'm just kind of, as Claudio was saying, just kind of having a lunch hour chat with some folks. Sure. Um, uh, for that, I, so I, I spent a good amount of time with the, the Federal Privacy Commissioner's Office as well. Um, I was with Waterfront Toronto trying to sort out a digital governance framework for their proposed project with, um, with Sidewalk Labs a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, I've done some consulting and contract work here and there. I, I held the pen on the, the Federal Privacy Commissioner uh, response to C11, that 70 page nightmare that may or may not have killed C11. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Awesome. Thank you, Vance. Um, again, uh, my connection with Vance goes back uh, probably well over a decade. We, we started at the IPC. We, we started at the provincial level, followed him to the federal level. We're back to the provincial level. So um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to keep in touch. And uh, certainly Amalia, uh, who is my partner in Managed Privacy Canada, only because we have so many ideas for doing great things within privacy that we thought this is the best way for us together to work together. And Amalia has a lot to say, but just give us that elevator uh, intro about yourself, Amalia, please. Sure, just very quickly, I'm a privacy professional. Um, I also teach courses and I created the Privacy uh, Management and the Digital Enterprise Certificate with my colleagues, Constantine Claudia and a few other people here. Um, uh, by way of background, I started in IT and then I accumulated uh, audit, risk management, security, all of those interesting things, project management and so on. And currently at Manage Privacy Canada, we work with clients to establish their privacy programs and assist them with anything new like such as today's webinar. Uh, just a, a little anecdote here. Uh, I've known Vance in when we were taking our CIPP exam together. <laughs> Not going to say how long. That's where I met him. And Constantine was my teacher before I took my CIPM. So there you go. Small world. It, it certainly is a small industry, and uh, uh, <laughs> and I certainly enjoy it. I, I I encourage everyone in attendance to look up our great panel and connect with them. Um, uh, they're, they, they're all full of, full of wisdom and information. We'll try to extract some of that for our recorded seminar today, which will go online uh, soon. But I want to give you the, the overall idea because we want everyone to, to leave today's session with, with key, uh, key elements and, and you want to have a lunch and learn, um, or at least a learn. <laughs> Um, in, a, in a structured way. The way we structured this is in those three parts. First of all, the state of privacy and how we got here. So generally, uh, a brief discussion on the past decade and what brought us to, to this point. What were, what were some of those pivotal moments in the past uh, decade. Then we'll talk about the current situation, what companies are doing today to comply with privacy regulations. And then we'll talk about a uh, third section that we call a steady state, towards a steady state. What will it take for organizations to prepare for the future? And what can they do today from the perspective of adopting uh, uh, privacy policies and practices that will make them, if not bulletproof, at least a little bit more resilient in the face of changing legislation? So without further ado, uh, let's let's see if we can go through the uh, over our panel in no particular order uh, and describe the most pivotal moments of the past decade and certainly those that led us to where we are uh, today. So maybe I can pick on on Vance. Um, Vance, what what are some of those pivotal moments uh, of the past few years? Sure. So I'm I'm. I, I'm appreciating that you've given us that decade timeline um, because it just still kind of fits in this, um, the, the 2012 getting accountability right um, paper that the federal office, um, Alberta and, and BC kind of joint, jointly created. So um, I was having a discussion with some folks from the UK 
um, from the UK ICO the other day. Um, just about another another project entirely, and you know we were discussing what you know what kind of things should be in it, and we got to uh, accountability, and they kind of just threw out this idea that um, oh accountability. That's, I mean you're from Canada, that's the home of accountability. I got like it's kind of interesting that that's you know the global perspective here is is that you know that. 2012 paper of you know how how to get accountability right with the privacy management uh, program is still so relied upon and so um, uh, so respected even even a you know a solid decade later. So when we're get, just having these discussions about you know operationalizing privacy, it's kind of I, I'm always slightly stunned that you know. We're having the discussions about how to do it because we've had a manual for for a solid decade now, um, and you know just from from my experience at, at regulators, like this, that's if something goes wrong, that's the first thing that always gets gets asked for. It's like show me your actual privacy man, show me your privacy management program, um, and quite frankly, like, quite often th those are. You know some of the main failings that are found in like breach investigations. You know we've seen um, uh, we've seen issues like um, security security safeguards kind of being passed verbally at, at staff meetings, and that kind of leading to to significant breaches because again you don't have a program established, so therefore you can't revise it, you can't see how effective it is, you can't you can't measure it, you can't really audit it. Um, and again, you just have this, this, these major issues that, that come up simply because of that lack of, of privacy management program. So I guess, again, I'm, I'm torn on saying whether or not that's the most, it's, it's a pivotal moment in the, past, in the past decade. It certainly should have been a pivotal moment in the past decade, um, but I'm kind of curious to hear from some, some of the uh, people who have more experience within organizations of you know, how much is that actually the case? How much of an impact did that guidance actually have? Excellent. Why don't we go to Constantine since he's seen uh, he's seen organizations on both sides of the border and probably beyond. Um, what are your views, Constantine? Well, you know, um, over the last decade, you know, and again, looking, contrasting, you know, developments in Europe as well as in the U.S., I guess what I, when, when you ask me, what's the state of privacy in Canada over the last say 10 years, I would say complacency in with tinged with increasing amounts of fear and loathing. And the complacency, because we did so well really early on, we got the pat on the back from the Europeans, we got adequacy. And then a lot of nothing has happened. Now, of course, provinces passed laws. Um, so that did move the, uh, I think, the um, things forward. But, you know, too many companies still have today a privacy policy on their website, and that's their only privacy policy. And it regurgitates the 10 principles of Pepita. Regurgitating the law is not a statement that actually helps people understand what it is you're doing with data. So what else is the problem? I see a lot of people who are typically general counsel, but they might be CIOs or CISOs on whom the organization has decided you're in charge of privacy. And they know that they don't have enough background and experience. They've been had something, you know, another 10 or 15% added to already a 150% job. And they know that they're not able to deal with um, what's really required. So it's com com not complacency so much as just hoping that nothing bad happens, which is to Vance's point about what happens when you finally start getting attention. And that's, you know, sort of like always been whenever you have an incident, you know, bad news, you've had a breach, good news, you've had a breach, because now you're going to actually focus on building the program because now you have no choice. But why does it always come to that, right? So I, I do feel that there's still a lot of room for Canadian companies to improve. And I think also the runway for them to actually do that is getting shorter and shorter, which is what's leading to the fear and loathing. 
and and, and all and and to up. and to your point constantine um the, the going back to the breach right uh, we've had this mandate there's different provincial legislation in different sectors they've had the mandate of breach how many companies we go in and they go oh well security records incidents well yeah. where's your breach log where is your data incident breach register and they don't know what we're talking about yes yes yeah so There's... what Sorry. i was just going to say so amalia since um since you piped up uh you're now on the spot uh tell us about those those pivotal moments well, I mean, the, to me, that was, um, you know, to, to Vance's point, we had a manual for 10 years. Um, and I'm not sure <laughs> if, if it was written with Invisible Ink or where the company is at for that. But to, Constantine was saying uh, people post a privacy notice um, that is um, oftentimes incomplete or um, let gives you kind of pause to to realize the the kinds of gaps that this company might have and they they publicly put it on the website so you realize from that one statement of trust that they put online that they have so many gaps in that one statement that you don't even want to imagine what's happening inside the company a, a dead giveaway amalia is when they've copied mine and forgotten to actually remove <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's that's that. They didn't even get, uh, give you uh, uh, the the uh, no royalties. No royalties. <laughs> royalties are <laughs> some sort of acknowledgement, uh, duly copied from Constantine. It, it counts as attribution when you don't bother to do a replace all. Right? Yeah. I mean, they take it as a compliment. Yes. Yes. Uh, it may not be terribly impressive to anybody coming across it. But and the, just just really quickly on this privacy notice, because there's been a very interesting conversation on LinkedIn yesterday that people are like, well, it's a privacy policy. It's a privacy notice. It's a duck. It's a, it's, it's a privacy online notice. And it, it is a promise that you make to your customers of how the state of your affairs inside your privacy program. If that promise is poorly written and lopsided, um, th that there's no better impression than the first impression. But that promise you have on the privacy online notice has to be mirrored inside the company with a privacy program, hence our getting accountability right paper. And maybe I'll let Derek uh, <laughs> talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> uh, th thank you. It in terms of pivotal moments, uh, I, I have to say the uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, it really woke the public up. And I think uh, that while we've had this manual, uh, you so aptly point to, Vance, uh, I believe that without the motivation, so either enforcement or consumer pressure is what it's going to take for companies to actually take action because companies have so many priorities uh, going on at any given time, adding a, a major one like privacy uh, without a damn good reason uh, is difficult. Uh, so I believe Cambridge Analytica started to wake the, the public up to what is be actually being done with their data. And I, th I think it, it really cracked a whole, um, it, it changed privacy in my opinion around the world. Uh, and then obviously GDPR coming in uh, has made a significant impact. Uh, you know, the, you can argue the good and the bad of it, but, uh, but it's, it's a law designed to protect people's data. And I think, um, I think uh, our first effort with Bill C-11 as Vince aptly pointed out with his 60 recommendations <laughs> uh, for change um, it, 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 they called it a balanced approach, but that thumb was heavily on the scale in favor of business. Uh, you know, the fact is, uh, our government does not want, uh, to cause any inconvenience to business. And what, what we're not realizing is, uh, we should not have been doing this in the first place. So the changing of the practices, yes, it's inconvenient for businesses, but it's, it's a long overdue cleanup. And um, I believe what's going to make the difference uh, this year is Bill 64 uh, will be enforced. And I believe that that is going to wake an awful lot of companies up and get them in action uh, regarding privacy management programs. 
Excellent. And, and, and setting the tone, right, Derek? Because yeah. they're setting such a high bar. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's actually tougher. You know, I've, I've had this conversation several times with both clients and on webinars. It's actually tougher than the GDPR in some aspects. Mm -hmm. For example, um, on, the, on the consent front, uh, with GDPR, most business in the EU is done under legitimate interests. And, you know, one of the things I noticed is that Quebec left that off. So the only tr two choices you have are contractual mm -hmm. or consent. Yeah. So what's the impact of that? Is that going to drive people back to more what, what I call traditional advertising? Because you can't use people's personal data online anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be interesting because it, uh, if I were some companies, I would take less risk, use less data and, uh, and go back to more traditional ways of, of promoting uh, the brand. It's certainly going to be interesting. <laughs> I yes. definitely agree yes. with you on that. And, <laughs> and by and large, there's a sense of, uh, based on what you've all said, there's a sense that we've literally been lucky. Businesses in Canada have been lucky over the past decade and a half getting by doing the bare minimum in some cases uh, or perhaps even less. And, mm -hmm. and I certainly find myself talking to companies about the difference in simple terminology, what's the difference between a policy versus a privacy notice? Yes. I mean, just knowing that simple foundational uh, element can help you better prepare for compliance. And, and certainly one of my big things is uh, when I talk to any kinds of organizations, when we're interviewing them, et cetera, they talk about where can I find a privacy template aside from stealing one from Constantine? Uh, well, if I go online and I Google it and I download it and I, I plaster it to my web page, am I okay then? <laughs> right? And so the idea is always that you want to reflect what you do rather than to just um, just sign your name at the bottom of a templated wish list of, of fair information principles. It, so it's that brings us... Like, yeah, Claudio, it's almost like um, uh, you, you, you invert the mirror. You have to start with your privacy program first and then reflect it on the privacy notice on, online. Right. I actually saw an automated version for generating your privacy notices. Uh, yep. or your, uh, your, your automatic public, yeah, policy and, generator. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's measured against the laws rather than against the program you have in place. So they, they, their promise to their customers or when the law changes, we'll change your privacy notice. And you're and all good. And it, yeah. And you're all good. It's got nothing to do That's with right. aligning uh, your internal policies with a, a promise as yeah. you aptly put Amalia, uh, that, uh, this is your promise to the public. This yeah. is how, what we're going to do with your data. And this is what we're not going to do with your data. And, um, and, and jump what's, in. that's got nothing to do with the law. And that's I'm got jump to in. do with your policies. Derek, just to yeah. pick up on that point, sure. recent action by the competition bureau, which exerted for the first time ever FTC style jurisdiction in Canada that held, you know, um, a company to account for not complying with its own privacy notice. Now that is, in my view, significant because, you know, the notice is a contract, as Amalia said, with the world. And it's the easiest thing for a regulator to actually look at because you put it out there. And I will say as a lawyer, I caution people in general, whenever somebody asks me for a template, whatever area of law it was, I'm going to go, no, because I don't know what damage you're going to do with it because you don't know how to use it properly. And I would say <laughs> the same is probably true with a lot of privacy programs, which start with here, let's buy a bunch of documents <laughs> or let's steal them from some other company. And then we'll just, you know, do a search and replace. Eh, kind of dangerous. You know, I've come across companies that have said, we are doing this with your data and they actually in, in, you know in, uh, in created or incurred greater responsibility liability than because they, they weren't actually doing most of that stuff but they'd copied it they were a, a process or service provider and they'd copied it from somebody who actually is acting as a controller or principal and it was all sorts of stuff they just didn't do yeah. so you know again you know there's a little bit well a little bit of you know ignorance is really dangerous 
a little bit of knowledge can go a long way just to steering you clear from potential um you know situations that you don't need to take on would you say that it's a lower risk then to copy it from a privacy lawyer uh, a privacy oh, policy i would say it's probably even more dangerous um you know, <laughs> That's intimidating. Well, you know, and because we, we tend to write, you know, for lawyers, and this is not actually a good thing anymore, right? That whole, like, writing in plain, and that's a requirement of Bill 64, and on Francais, by the way, because let's not forget that you're going to have to be able to communicate clearly and simply in, in both French. Language. So, yeah. you know, to move to the current situation, what I view Bill 64 is doing to pick up on Derek's point is, basically importing GDPR to Canada. And I've already been supporting clients, dealing with clients in Europe. This is gonna have big supply chain consequence because you know it all feeds down through um, the supply chain, through your business to business relationships. Um, and I don't think Canadian companies, again, have, you know, maybe they, they're like, I go back to the fear and loathing thing. They don't wanna look at it. So they're just not thinking about it yet. But you've got a, a increasingly short runway, like I said before, to get yourself ready for some of the things that you're actually going to be required by your business partners to do. So, yeah, uh, one one of the things I think we kind of need to establish is that uh, the, the perception that uh, because this is a Quebec law, that you have to have offices in Quebec in order for this law to apply, and I. I, I think that what people have to understand is that 22.5% of the population in Canada is based in Quebec. And the, so the chances are, if you're, if you're holding a national database of any kind, chances are 20 to 25% of your list is Quebec citizens. Therefore, Bill 64 applies. And if you have any and I think I think that point. I think yeah. that point really needs to be underlined. This is a law that's going to change the privacy landscape in Canada, not just Quebec. And if your business customers have the same sort of proportions, if you're, again, a service provider doing any kind of services, you know, as a processor, as we like to say, you're going to have that passed down to you. So uh, it's, it's inevitable you're going to be having to contend with these issues at a certain point. 